So, um, review session last night, um, a little, slightly poorly attended compared to our previous weeks. Uh, not as many people showed up, which is sad. Um, I mean, it was good for the people that were there. I'm not saying, you know, I wish you were somewhere else. But um, I hope that you are, how can I put this well? I hope that you're realizing that you need to review for this AP exam. That this isn't something you're just going to walk into and be fine. Um, so if you are not coming to the review sessions, if you're unable to, if, I, if you're unable to come to the review sessions, you need to just figure out how you can make that stuff up, how you can do that. If you're just not coming because it's inconvenient or it seems like a lot of work, I certainly hope you're doing something on your own. So. Uh, if you didn't make it and you want the handouts, they're over on that shelf. I also put, would you grab the sheet that's right next to you? That one right there, yeah. I also put the, that last page of the uh, list of terms and stuff um, that's on the last page of your packet, the stuff that Mr. Thompson found for us. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. Like the list of terms that the College Board says you have to know and then the ones you should know. Uh, week one is over there. We didn't have that for week one, but I copied week one and it's over there. Um, they can, everybody can get it on their own. You don't need to pass it out to everybody right now. Uh, if it's important enough to them, they'll remember it. Uh, so that is over there. Um, and you can come get it any time soon, kids. It's over on the shelf over there. Um, so, um, Hey, you know what's not going to happen today? Yes, me lecture. Isn't that exciting? You guys okay? I would have thought you would have been more excited about that. It's been a long week. It has been a long week. That's why I would have think you'd just be like, hey, God, we don't have to listen to it. Or maybe you're thinking, like, good, when are you going to shut up? Um, so, uh, only other thing I want to talk about, only other announcement I want to make, actually two other. One, you have no homework this weekend. Like, legit, no homework this weekend. Okay? Now, the point, the point of this, obviously, is for you to take advantage of this and not eat the marshmallow and study. Okay? This is one of three weekends left before the AP exam. Three weeks from now is the day. Okay, three weeks from today, seventh period, in exactly three weeks, you will be taking the AP exam right now. Uh, so make sure you take advantage of that. I know it's going to be gorgeous this weekend. Sit outside and study. Get a study group of people. Bring snacks. Get some iced tea, some lemonade. Make a day out of it. Not a day. Make a few hours out of it. Make a date out of it. Sure, sure. Take it as an opportunity. Boys, this is like a chance here. You'd be like, hey, we get in a study group together. Like, it's very safe. Like, you'll get a chance to talk to a girl. Um, and you even have a script. You'd be like, let's talk about 1848. Like, you don't even need to come up with anything on your own. You have, like, built-in things to talk about. Girls, give them a chance, okay? Uh, just to study, I'm not saying any other chance. Uh, <laughs> Got to start somewhere. Um, all right, we have a lot to talk about today, or more accurately, you have a lot to talk about today. I'm not going to talk much today. That's a lie, probably, but I'm trying not to. Um, so you need to take out the domestic and family issues lecture that we did and the domestic docs. You need to take out 1968, Space Race, Arms Race, and Vatican II. I think four. Well, no, five. I'm sorry. Yeah. So there's the lecture. There's the lecture and this. Those are the domestic docs. Lecture and this. These are the domestic docs. Family issues. There's 1968, Space Race, Time Race, Space Race, Arms Race, and Vatican II. 
you do. I, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have used you as my sample if you did. Uh, I was sure that was Yep. Uh, all right, Hannah, did you get everything? Why are you just sitting there not getting everything? Uh, all right, I want you to start with the domestic and family lecture. Um, with your partner, I want you to talk about, here's the first question I want you to talk about is, what are the biggest differences within the sides here? So these guys are all on the same side. They all have the same general world goals. What are the big problems between those people, between those guys on the same side? Go ahead and have that conversation. Okay, I was like, like, um, okay, so, oh, yeah, I just like, 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 here, so the first few pages here. Um, any questions on uh, stuff in the West? Great Britain, France, West Germany, any of those? For me, one of the important points that I hope doesn't get overlooked, I mean, obviously, you're going to remember De Gaulle, you're going to remember the welfare state, those things are going to be pretty well driven home. Um, that slide that talked about racism in the West, that is going to become even bigger as we get into um, the later 70s, early in 90s, uh, 80s and 90s, excuse me. Um, it becomes an issue. If each uh, country has their own group that has that presents challenges to it. Is anybody missing a seashell? No? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't find your seashell. Uh, all right, if anybody knows, if anybody is missing a seashell. Uh, so that, that racism issue, that idea about what is going to be, what is a European? Um, if you live there for, if you're second generation, third generation, but you are not a white Christian, can you still be a European? Can you still be an Englishman if you're uh, an Indian Hindu? Can you still be a Frenchman? 
if you are a black Muslim. Um, and this brings up a lot of questions. And, and it's interesting because the part for me that I find most interesting is throughout our civil war and even into our civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, Europe kind of made fun of us. They're like, how can you have such a race problem? How are you so unenlightened, America? How are you so you know, backwards that you have this issue? And it was real easy for them to say because they didn't have a race issue because there was only one race. Yeah, it, it, was, it was white dudes. It was white Christians. And that's really about it. And then we see how well they dealt with their Jewish population. They were really open and free with that. Um, but then as soon as Europe started to have uh, as soon as they started to have integration, they began to experience a lot of the same problems um, from the white side. This might be kind of a dumb question, but what, why did like, the Nazis become great? Like, what made them so the long, the long story short is they couldn't afford empire anymore. Like England and France were, they could not afford to have this far-flung global empire um, that they wanted to have. Um, you actually have a reading on it, uh, I want to say you get it Wednesday, I think. Um, you'll get the reading on decolonization that goes into it a little bit more. Um, any other questions on the West? I wish you didn't actually ask any questions. All right, in the Soviet sphere. So take a look at within the Soviet bloc. We talked about two different families here. No? Yeah. I know, like, you talked about, like, racism in the West. Was there racism in Soviet bloc, like, back in, like, I don't know, like, was it just different? It was different. I would say there definitely was. I mean, the Eastern bloc was dominated by the Soviet Union. Soviet Union's dominated by Russia. Um, Russia is dominated by party members. So it wasn't race and ethnicity as much as it was location and position. Does that make sense? So it wasn't like the Russian party members looked down on the military. Oh, no, they did. They absolutely did. It just wasn't necessarily as impactful as a uh, native German you know, protesting against the influx of Turks. Good question. I actually didn't know the answer to this until about two years ago. Somebody asked, like, so, like, when they did the Prague Spring, did they send in Czech soldiers? They wouldn't send in those divisions. So, like, Warsaw had like, I mean, you know, you, each country had to send in a certain amount of guys and those troops stayed together. It's not like when they got there and they jumbled them all together. And so they wouldn't deploy the Czech troops in 1968. They didn't de deploy the Hungarian troops in 1956. Good question. It took me an odd amount of time to find the answer to that question too. Like that's one of those weird things like, what do you Google? Like. Were there Hungarian Warsaw Pact troops in Hungary in 19... Like, I don't know. It took me a while to find it. Maybe I'm just not a good Googler. So, like, are you Stalin? Googling of Earth? Yeah. Googling is... Can you be a Googler? Is it a noun, though? No. Like, I'm a Googler? I just sound weird. <laughs> so I'm I just sound weird. Yeah. All right. Sorry, Maggie. Go ahead. So, like, under Stalin's state, the party was subordinate. Under Khrushchev, was, like... Um, well, like, who was, like, the main? Good question. So nobody's going to have as much power as Stalin did. We're not going to see anybody have as much power as, power as Stalin did. The party is going to have a larger role, but the premier still directs the party. Does that answer your question well enough? I know it sounds very convoluted, but... The one part I want to highlight here is the art and culture of the Soviet Union. I think this is a really interesting part. Um, it all has to promote socialism. Um, it's all about the party. It's all about socialism. And how this contrasts with our man up here, 
Jackson Pollock. You want to know an ironic part? There is some scholarship. Here, look, there's the Jackson Pollock. There's some scholarship that says that Jackson Pollock's work was covertly and through back channels funded by the CIA. Not, 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 not directly, not like the CIA director is like writing a check like to Jackson Pollock. But they supported organizations that supported funds, that supported artists, because what better way to contrast the two systems, then here is socialist art, and here is the only way to do it. But then look at what America used to do. And here's freedom of expression, action art, just painting, just splattering things everywhere. And I know what a lot of you think when you look at that. You're like, that's so dumb, I could have done that. But, you know what? You didn't. And Jackson Pollock did. Ah. Uh, so I just think it's interesting. I think that's a great contrast. The Soviet art, the Soviet architecture, uh, even Soviet literature, such as there was. And the contrast, you know, you look at Jackson Pollock and it's like, oh, yeah. Freedom. Oh. So, uh, all right, if there's nothing else on that, then we'll take a look at the document activity on England and France. I actually, I know I rarely do this. I want you to go straight through this. I want you to talk about the NHS, not National Honor Society, okay? Um, one that actually means something. Uh, oh, oops, what? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm still bitter. I wasn't allowed in the NHS because I got a detention. I'm still angry about it. What's that? It, it was more the, like, background behind it, but I'm still angry. That's not true. I turned out okay. You can't do that and then just not tell us. That's actually not true at all. <laughs> it's going to be really easy. Um, so I want you to go through, um, I want you to go through, talk about the NHS, talk about the coal mines, and then go into France. So I know rarely do we actually take the time to go through the whole thing, but I want you to talk through this whole thing with your partner. Um, because each of them are important. Okay, go ahead. I still don't do the new seats. Who's not here? Stacy, thank you. Oh, she's a mother. Right. Oh, yeah. About a minute to finish up this one, maybe a little less. Yeah, I 
What's cradle to the grave mean? Well, what's it imply? You get health care. Yeah. Welfare from the very beginning of your lifespan. And who is providing that welfare? Government. They're going to take care of you from the cradle to the grave. Does it come free? Taxes. Taxes pay for it. The top tax rate tax rates in England today, the wealthiest people, top tax rates about 55%. What? Yeah. Okay. But you get school, including university, health care, that's dental, medical, eye, that's all that stuff provided for you. Okay. It's a very different thing. This is why a lot of times they'll be Big time stars who make their home address technically elsewhere. Sir Mick Jagger does not legally live in England. He wants to keep more of his money. I don't know if Sir Paul McCartney does or not. I'm not sure about that. Um, now, what if you want to send your kid to private school? Do you get to not pay taxes? still pay taxes. It's just like here, right? Do you guys know people who go to Carmel? Their parents still pay the enormous property taxes for Libertyville, right? Thank you, by the way. You just that paid my salary. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I always thought it when people start complaining about taxes. I'm like, yeah, I think they're awesome. <laughs> Keep them coming. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Uh, why are coal mines so significant? Why is the nationalization of coal mines in England so significant, Michael? And, it, and what did it drive? What did it essentially bring about? The Industrial Revolution. Uh, yeah, it is the like it's the granddaddy of them all, right? I mean, this is the this is what allowed Wakanda to become England, right? It's coal mine. This is hugely symbolically important. And now I didn't ask you to do this on the sheet, uh, but what I'd like you to do now is, I I'm shifting gears to France, by the way, going on to the next one. Describe post-war France in a sentence. You can do it with your partner, you can write it out, however you want to do it. Describe post-war France in a sentence. Go ahead. I tell you, the, the scope of this reading, like round one, round two, I'm good with. All right. Uh, let's move on to 1968 then. So you have the year of the barricade, 1968. This is written by uh, John Chris. Uh, he's a professor that Mr. Thompson and I both had at uh, American Military University. Um, you've read a handful of his things already this year. Uh, I like his lectures. He does a pretty good job on them. Um, the question I want you to debate with your partner right now. Was 1968, I'm sorry, first let me pull back. When I'm talking about 1968, I'm talking separate from the Prague Spring. The Prague Spring, which also happened in 1968, which we talked about in the lecture a couple days ago, that's separate from the 1968 you read about last night, right? Okay. Um, what I want you to talk about is, was 1968, should we put that in the legacy of 1830, 1848, 
I'm sorry, I should start. Should we put 1968 in the legacy of 1789, 1830, 1848, 1871? Should this go in the pantheon of revolution? Go ahead and debate that with your partner. say it goes in the pantheon. It should be in the same conversation as. Two. Then why not? Those of you who say it shouldn't be, the majority who say it shouldn't be. Fair enough. I think that's a good place to start. I agree with that. Why else? The rest of you said it shouldn't be? You said also, although it was like um, widespread, there was only specific groups that could study it. And Who? It wasn't, it wasn't everyone, like it wasn't students, like, yeah, it was just like, didn't affect them. What students? Lives. University students. Which implies what about them? Oh, hold on to that, we'll get there in one second. It implies what about their family in the background? They, get, they, they have money. At least some, right? So they're wealthy, educated kids, and they don't have anything else to do. Like literally, you guys are going to be blown away. That's going to be the biggest cultural shock for you when you go to college. You're going to be like, I have all of this time, and I don't know what to do with it. Probably eventually you will. But like literally, like that's going to be the biggest thing. You're going to get to college and be like, all right, I have class at 8, 9, 10, and 11. And then oh, but after school, I have no, wait, there's no school. I don't have practice because I'm not. Yeah. OK, well, I guess I'm going to protest the heck out of things. Um, now. That's not to say that there weren't some legitimate grievances, all right? Like, for example, in France, one of the things they were complaining about at the Sorbonne was that there was not members of the opposite sex allowed in dorms. I mean, like, wow. if you wanted to, like, liberté, égalité, fraternity, you know, workers of the world unite, like, we want cohabitation privileges. So it's a little different. It's angry kids. Now, again, I'm not saying that there weren't some legitimate grievances, but I don't know that we can put this in the same category. Hey, look, Chicago stood very big in 1968, too, one of our prouder moments. It actually was called a police riot. Generally, those are the people you're hoping that are stopping riots, but they did this one. Proud moment in Chicago history. Uh, look at the barricade, by the way. See it? They made it with cars. Modern version of the barricade. Uh, now, I will say this was essentially against the grown-ups. Who is this against? I just called them grown-ups, so it's another way of putting this. 1968's against who? The man. The man. He's keeping us down. That's who this rebellion is against. Like, it's so unfair, man. Like, I don't want to live by your rules. I want to live my own life. It's the man. Uh, take a quick look. We have just a couple minutes to do this. Uh, what groups did you come up with for the DBQ quiz? 
that was there. It's an old school DBQ, but essentially I was more interested in you finding out about 1968 than really practicing DBQ-ness for this. Um, so, sorry, I guess I should have put a little mark next to it. I can see that. Um, so, go ahead and tell me the partner about what groups you came up with. Have at it. Uh, yeah. 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 Wow. <laughs> That's why we don't do the question yeah, because they don't do questions like that. Yeah, I did Right. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's uh, take a look at the space race and the arms race, if you would be so kind. Uh, so let's go ahead and do your sentence summary with your partner. We'll start with that. Sorry, I've got to get to my sheet here. Um, go ahead and uh, do your sentence summaries with your partner. Have it. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Oh, you. Yeah. And like uh, one cause and then like and then a response to the cause and then like different things. So the reason why we don't do this this question anymore is they wouldn't ask a question like that because it'd be too hard to set up. Um, I just like the way we would have done this is like a couple causes and a couple responses. Um, but don't worry about it. Don't get caught up in it because you won't see a question like that anymore. Okay. What's the point? What's the point of the space race and the arms race? To see what ideology is better. All right. Who, whose system is better? Why do they have to do that? Why don't they just fight each other? Because of the creation. Okay. So why have these missiles if you're not going to use them? Does anybody know what term we use for that? Nate said to, to make sure the other guys don't use them. Well, that's the that's the outcome of this. You're right. That is an important term to know. We call that the deterrent effect. It deters you from using them because you know the other side will use yours or use theirs. Sorry. And it was very successful. Now that wasn't the plan going into this, but it was very successful. Um, now you will never be expected to know the exact like steps in the space race. Uh, but I, I would know Sputnik. Um, you know, um, I love this political cartoon. I wanted to take a minute um, for you to talk about this. This is an English political cartoon. Talk about what the author, the author, what the artist is getting at with this cartoon. Go ahead, have at it. Alright, well, it shows like 
But yeah, I feel like it's kind of like yeah, they're making fun of us. But they still don't have the greatest form. Much of the plot very ramshackle, and not really doing anything. These poor people living in squalor, but the Soviet Union's able to put something up in space. Uh, now, for the majority of the space race, who is ahead? Russia. Soviet Union is ahead. Basically, every major step, they're ahead, right? First in satellite. First to put a dog in space. First to put, what's that? Turtles, Turtles in space. So they wanted to see what it did with amphibians. Uh, also, that sounds like a good movie. Turtles in space. Uh, the first man in orbit, Yuri Garrigan, became a, a, a hero. Uh, basically everything. I'll get there in a second. Uh, but then the ultimate prize was what? Get into the moon. And we got there first. Um, which effectively ends the space race. Um, everybody kind of stops. Funding is, the, uh, funding is cut back. Um, and it's put in different directions. Uh, by the way, I, I don't know if I've told you this. There's a really cool kind of side story. Um, you know, President Nixon had two speeches for that day in 1969. Oh, yeah. Did we talk about this in this class? He had a speech for if they were not able to come home, if they were trapped on the moon. Because if you ever listen to Kennedy's words carefully when he announces the goal to be on the moon, we pledge by the end of this decade to put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. Because it's really not that exciting if you can get him there, right? The trick is getting him back, too. And Nixon actually had a speech written for him if it became apparent that they were going to be trapped there. That those guys were going to die on the moon because that was a fair likelihood. Um, so it's a, I believe it's in his presidential museum now. I believe the speech is there. Um, never had to give it. They made it. Yeah. It was a big step. Um, the arms race. Uh, now, the space race, of course, always had military undertones. Um, but then the arms race. Uh, now, this is going a little bit further. Um, this is going into the 80s a little bit, but I want to talk just a minute for about this. Um, it's a program called the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI. Everybody called it Star Wars, because that's when the movies were coming out. It was a series of satellites and mirrors that shot lasers. So if the Soviets shot a missile at us, an ICBM, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, we would be able to pinpoint it and use lasers to shoot the missile out of the sky. Pretty amazing, isn't it, that we had that technology back then? We got We didn't. We still don't have it. We still don't have lasers that can shoot missiles. We have missiles that shoot other missiles, and they succeed about 50% of the time. In controlled tests. Yeah, it's covered Most people believe the whole point of this was to bankrupt the Soviet Union. Because if we had lasers that could shoot down their missiles, what is their nuclear arsenal no longer? It's no longer a deterrent, right? Because we can launch ours and not worry about theirs. So they had to build more missiles and they had to spend more money to try to counteract our strategic defense initiative. That never went anywhere. We spent millions and billions and billions of dollars on space lasers that never came close to being a thing. But we could do that because we could deficit spend because we have good credit. Soviet Union could not. A lot of people point to this as one of the factors in bringing down the Soviet Union. Then I also just like looking at uh, these, oh, nuclear submarines you're reading, talked about, I forgot about this slide. Uh, that becomes much scarier because now they're right off the coast. 
Uh, oh, I love this cartoon. This is a cartoon that I think great, illustrates mad, the concept of mad. Um, and then I just think these numbers are pretty amazing. Um, I believe it's in 1981 that each side had the ability to destroy the surface of the Earth 12 times over with their nuclear arsenal. They, they called it overkill, literally was the term for it. Now... Let's move on from that to Vatican II. <laughs> There's our smooth transition right there. Yeah. Uh, all right, hopefully you noticed that this was a primary document, that the first part there was a primary document. It was from Time Magazine in 1965, so while Vatican II is going on. Um, and then the comparison and contrast is asking about, to compare the only two big church councils that we talked about, Trent and Vatican II. Um, so make sure you understand what Vatican II is first, um, and then go ahead and talk about the comparisons with Vatican II and Trent. Okay, go ahead. It's a great description of it. Wait, the Protestants? Thank you. Thank you. You're fine. No What's the idea of Vatican II? Not the only Christian group, not the only world view, perhaps. They're trying, have you guys ever, this is one of my favorite long jokes, have you guys ever heard the joke, guy goes up to heaven, um, he dies and he's walking around with St. Peter and he's seeing all his friends and he's like, this is great, this is great, and kind of cruising around and then he sees this big huge wall that goes up as high as, it can, as, high as he can see and he's like, St. Pete, he's like, why, why would there be a wall in heaven? I, I don't understand, I thought we were all brothers and sisters up here. He goes, oh, that's for the Catholics. They think they're the only ones up here. Um, and I think that that's especially a pre-Vatican II view. In a word, Vatican II is trying to do what with the church? Modernize? Can we use liberalize? Okay. Is it successful? Semi. The only thing I would add is there's a lot of people who go against it. There's a very large, considerable group of Catholics, I shouldn't say large, there's a considerable group of Catholics who want to go back to pre-Vatican II. Stop letting women have an opinion on anything. Stop letting them serve communion, be altar servers. That's of the devil. 
can't have a woman hand me a piece of bread. That's blasphemy. She should be in the kitchen making me bread. See how I tied that together there? Not the, not the opinions of the speaker. Uh, this is going on the interwebs. I don't, I'm going to be running for office one day, and that clip's going to be completely out of context. I need you guys to come to my defense. Um, so, um, and we'll talk more about that when we get into the uh, 80s and 90s, too. We'll talk more about religion. But this is one of those connections that, you know, connecting Trent to Vatican II um, to make sure that you can do some comparing and contrasting with that. Because those are the only two church councils that we really talk about enough. Anything else? There were a few. They had a lot of meetings. They are Europeans, keep in mind. Yeah. No, not a waste of time, but more dealt with inter church issues which aren't really relevant to our conversation. Uh, okay. I'm going to stop the video now so we can be ourselves.